Um, I'm going to talk about basically uh, you know, doing next generation big data using a next generation language, which is uh, Scala and the way we're using it in Spark. So this talk will be, uh, you know, it, it will not be sort of the usual introduction to Spark kind of talk. Uh, maybe uh, you've seen such a talk before, and I know there was also one on Spark streaming yesterday. Um, it, it will have a little bit about what Spark is, you know, in case you, you haven't seen too much about it, but then most of it will be kind of interesting things we're doing in it with Scala. And this will include things that we're doing in the user facing API to let you have an API that's um, you know easy to program with and efficient at the same time and it will include some things that we're doing under the hood inside the project uh, to quickly build out you know basically a new data processing platform for these clusters um, so, so that's what I'll, that's what I'll talk about. So, what is Spark? So, you know, overall, it's uh, it's supposed to be a, a fast and general-purpose cluster computing system that's compatible with Hadoop and the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, and it's supposed to provide a more powerful uh, uh, computation uh, engine. And it does that in two ways. Uh, first of all, it improves efficiency over MapReduce uh, by giving you the ability to do computing in memory and also giving you the ability to do general. Uh, graphs of, of uh, computations, not just map and reduce. Um, and second, it improves usability through these uh, functional APIs, essentially, in Scala, Java, and Python. And one of the fun things about it is you can also use it interactively from the Python shell. Um, so on the first part, you can get, you know, with the in-memory, uh, if you use the in-memory feature, you can uh, run as much as 100 times faster than MapReduce-based systems. Even on disk with uh, the more general computation graphs, you can actually see a significant speed up. And in the second part, you often write, you know, many times less code than, than traditional uh, map and reduce programming. Um, Spark started out as a research project um, at UC Berkeley, you know, where I was until recently. It started in, in 2009, and we open sourced it, and it's been going as a community since. So last time I counted, uh, there were over 50 companies now uh, contributing code to it. You know, so, some of the ones are up there. Uh, Databricks, by the way, is, is a startup, um, you know, started almost exactly a year ago by the original Spark team that continues to build Spark and, and um, also offers it as a hosted service. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, and you know, in, in the past year, actually, Spark has also become the most active open source project in the big data space, more active than projects like Hadoop and Storm and uh, you know, Hadoop file system and stuff like that. Um, and increasingly, Spark is not just a, a computing engine, but a general purpose platform. So on top of the core engine, we've built um, these higher level libraries for things like SQL to deal with structured data. Um, Spark SQL is the new SQL engine that replaces, you had, we had a previous project called Shark. Uh, we've built a system for streaming, which you saw yesterday, um, graph processing, and machine learning. And the unique thing about these things in Spark is that these are not separate computing systems that you have to you know, go out and install that happen you know, to, to talk to each other, they're actually just libraries built on top of the same engine. So that means it's very, um, uh, both very easy and very efficient to compose them into an application. And uh, you know, once you install Spark, you can actually run any of these things together because the underlying engine um, is quite general. So this is just a, a graph you know, to show so, some of the activity um, in the project. So as I mentioned, in, in the past year especially, we, uh, you know, we um, uh, have had a very fast growth in the community. And uh, we're, we're, by many metrics, uh, we're, we're the most active um, open source project in the big data space, as I can see. So this is commits per month. A commit here for, for Spark is, uh, is an entire patch. It's not just a git commit. Um, and this is lines of code changed. Um, Again, in the past six months, and you know, we're, you know, we have a lot of stuff going on um, uh, throughout the project. Um, and then this graph here is showing the growth in contributors over time. And you know, you can see even, uh, you know, even though the project's become very active, it's still growing really quickly. And um, we have, in the past few months, we've had over 50 people contribute to the project each month. And what's exciting to me about this is the activity in all the Hadoop projects is, is continuing to go really fast. It's not like 
people have stopped working on Hive or on MapReduce or on stuff like that. But with Spark, I think we're able to reach um, you know, a wider community in, in many ways. We're able to reach, for instance, data scientists. We're able to reach people uh, who code in Python, not just on the JVM. And because of that, I think we see, um, we see a lot of growth in, um, in the community. Okay, so a little bit on the uh, the programming model, just to set the stage, uh, you know, for for the other stuff I want to talk about uh, later. So in. Spark, the, the main um, uh, idea you work with is these distributed collections uh, called Hazelian Distributed Datasets, or RDDs. The Hazelian part is just because we automatically provide fault tolerance for them. So you know we end up with this somewhat longer name. But basically, these are just immutable collections of objects in the Scala API. They're just Scala objects that are divided across your cluster. And uh, as a programmer, you know these, these collections are statically typed. So each RDD has a type of element in it, and that actually affects what you can do with it. Um, so just as a one slide kind of, you know, what does the API look like? Basically, you have, you create this thing called the Spark context, uh, and then you create RDDs from it, from input sources. So for example, we might say, okay, we have a text file, and we want to read it as a bunch of lines, and this is an RDD of strings. And you know, if this is a file in HDFS, we might be reading it in parallel across a cluster. Uh, then you do transformations, and basically all our transformations are, are um, you know, very closely matching the, the Scala collections library. So if you know how to use that, uh, you know how to use a lot of Spark. So, and you can just pass in a Scala um, closure in there, uh, or just a function in your program, and we automatically like, grab it and its dependencies and ship it to the cluster nodes. Um, and one, one interesting thing with this is uh, these derived data sets that you get from transformations are lazily evaluated. So we actually wait until we see everything you do, and then we can come up with an efficient plan to execute all of them. Um, and finally, you can do these uh, output operations called actions, such as saving this thing as a file, and that kicks off a computation and figures out how to deal with the lazily evaluated stuff. So it's you know basically if you've worked with collections and especially with uh, with the the lazy collections or, or views in Scala, uh, you've probably seen a bunch of this stuff. Um, on top of just the basic collection stuff, um, as I said, you have these rich libraries uh, that you can actually integrate together to do different types of processing. So much as RDDs you know, can contain any type of Scala object, our libraries are set up to just operate on, on these RDDs, and you can easily combine many types of processing that um, you know, in traditional, like in, in previous big data systems, required you to install a separate system. So for example, if you want to do SQL, um, for, for instance, to access data in Apache Hive for SQL on Hadoop, um, you have this thing called Hive Context, and you can run a SQL query on it, and we push that all the way you know, to the cluster to where the data is sitting, um, and you get back an RDD of row objects. And once you have these objects, you can just run a map on them you know, using the core API. Maybe you want to turn them into, say, vectors to do some machine learning, so you know, have a function function to, to, to turn these into numerical features um, from, from, say, these tweets that we have here. Um, and then you want to train a machine learning model. So you know that's just a library function. Um, and finally, you might want to take a stream. A stream is uh, similar to an RDD. It's a, it's a typed collection, except new data comes in over time. Um, and you might want to actually use that model. So here we want to filter out uh, tweets that, that match, uh, you know, that, that fall into cluster zero, according to this k-means clustering um, and maybe print them out. Um, so you know, if this looks very simple, that's that's good. That's that's really the goal of it. But uh, the the point of this is uh, this kind of thing in, in the past required you to you know install two or three separate systems: one that can do SQL, one that can do machine learning, one that can do streaming, and then figure out ways to hook them together. And here they're just one one program you put together. And you know the benefit for that, apart from the programmability benefit, is you can also optimize execution across these types of computations. So if you use separate engines, the more traditional ways of doing stuff, you might do something like um, map reduce for the extract, transform, and load part for, for just pulling in data. You might use something um, uh, different, like say uh, giraffe for, uh, for, uh, for, for the training of a, of a machine learning model. Um, and then you might use something, you know, third engine like, say, Impala or Storm to use the model to, to query data. 
and um, using Spark, and, and basically with these, you know, you have to read and write the data from a, a file system in between each step, and you actually spend a lot of time uh, just moving data around between systems, not actually doing any work. Uh, using Spark, you can hook all these steps right after each other, uh, not have the data leave memory, for example, between them, and actually finish the pipeline faster. And you can use this stuff from the interactive shell, or you can just write the data back out um, and have a batch job. Um, and you know, for, from my point of view, the, the, the reason you know, this stuff is, is interesting is, and, and the reason we want to have this concise API is uh, you know, the, basically to, to really make this um, uh, you know, big data um, uh, useful to a lot of organizations, you need to not just make it easy for, you know, for programmers to work with big data, which is a lot of, you know, when you read about MapReduce, it's all, you know, the, now uh, any programmer can build a distributed system easily. But you need to make it easy even for people who are not programmers, who are, for instance, data scientists or you know, um, uh, business analysts or people like that. And these kind of very high-level APIs, such as SQL and such as you know, the machine learning library, um, help, um, you know, help those, those kinds of uh, domain experts actually uh, use these data sets. So that's, that's what we're trying to achieve. So, why did we pick Scala for Spark at the beginning? Uh, I'll just talk about this, uh, you know, uh, quickly because people, uh, you know, people often ask. Uh, so when we started the project, this was in 2009. Scala was definitely a very much an up-and-coming language, but it was not as as well established and as popular um, as now. Uh, but the good thing is, you know, we were a research group, so we we just wanted to do cool stuff. Uh, in, in a sense, if uh, you know, if people didn't end up using the system, but but they learned from it and other systems were built in a separate way, that was still a good result. So, but we, we chose Scala for three reasons. Um, so first one was just usability. Uh, we wanted to have a very concise API. Microsoft's link had come out pretty recently, and we wanted something uh, like that that lets you mix you know, very high-level operators with snippets of your programming language uh, and uh, very quickly write applications. And we wanted the interactive shell, and you know, Scala was a language that had both of those. Um, the second really important aspect, though, was efficiency. So, you know, for that first part, you could have imagined using just Ruby or Python or something like that. Um, but when you work with big data, efficiency actually really matters. A factor of 100, um, you know, um, overhead for doing something may mean the difference between, uh, you know, your, your query taking an hour or your query taking, uh, you know, a couple of seconds. So, uh, so that actually really matters. And static typing is still uh, essentially, you know, the, the best way to, <laughs> to, to get uh, code with predictable performance. So it, it helps immensely uh, to, uh, you know, to control the performance, to control the memory usage of code. And with something like Scala, you can get that and still have the very high level API. In many cases, the typing um, is fairly invisible to the user. And as a whole, you know, doing big data stuff on the JVM has, has been interesting, but uh, we find at least that the JVM can, can, can give you a good balance between usability features and performance. So by usability or, or utility features, I mean uh, things like, oh, I want to add code to my system at runtime. That's, that's kind of important for uses like the interactive shell that I talked about, where the user is typing the code, you know, after your program starts. So, uh, and that's, that's pretty hard to do in, uh, you know, in, in something like C or C++ to, to just compile and, and add in some new code uh, that easily. Um, at the same time, though, the way it executes is documented enough and, and there are enough hooks that you can have high performance code as well. And as an example, in, in Spark, in the machine learning library, we, we uh, increasingly use uh, JNI, JNI to access fast numerical libraries. And actually, we found you know, when we tune the algorithms in there, they can be very competitive with, uh, with even C++ and MPI systems for these things, depending on you know, what the algorithm is. But for anything you know, CPU-bound, we, um, we can reach the same performance. Um, so that's, you know, I think it's a, it's a nice balance between these two. <clears throat> and finally, the third reason we went for Scala was the Java compatibility, and that's because a lot of the existing big data ecosystem was in Java. And um, using Scala, we were able to just reuse uh, big parts of that. So one of the biggest things that we used is the Hadoop uh, input and output API called input format. And for the longest time, the only I.O. code in Spark was about 500 lines of code that let you access any Hadoop input format. And with this, we could talk to HDF. 
DFS, we could talk to HBase, Cassandra, you know, MongoDB, all this like zoo of, um, of, of scalable data stores. We could talk to all the data formats they support. You know, as people added data formats to Hadoop, we were able to support them. And so we could just focus on, on building a compute engine and not having to reinvent all these things. And this was, I think, one of the, the key decisions that, that led the project scale and, and continue to be useful. Okay. So that's, that's kind of you know, why we use Scala initially, and I think everyone saw, okay, you can do functional programming, makes a lot of sense for big data, you, know, you want to pass a function to run your, your code. Um, so what I really want to, uh, to cover though in this talk is sort of fun part is um, using Scala beyond these, these obvious uh, things, beyond like, oh, you know, we're, we're passing functions around and, and um, you know, maybe we have types. And I'm going to, to go through four different places where we're using Scala in different ways. Some of them are user-facing API, some of them are internal things, but they show you a little bit of what we've been able to do with it and what's let us um, uh, move uh, quickly and, and grow the project quickly. <clears throat> so first one is probably the, the simplest one, but it is important for users. It's to have friendly types for things. Um, if you look at these big data processing systems out there, actually even some of the Scala-based ones are, are fairly loose about types. So um, they, uh, you know, basically you, you, you kind of have to keep track of the, the, the schema of each row or, or each record of data as you pass it through and make sure you run the right operations on each column of it. So um, they, you know, if you're not careful, you might try to average a column that's something like strings, or you, know, you might try to access a column that doesn't exist, and you're not going to discover that until um, runtime when, when your program will, you know, will throw an exception. So in Spark, we used um, essentially Scala implicits to make um, operations available on only the right types. And this is just, it's a really standard way of doing things. It's used you know, uh, in many places throughout the Scala library, uh, but it is, it is pretty nice. So you know, if, if you're new to Scala, this is kind of the, the things that it lets you do. So for instance, in Spark, if, if you have an RDD of key value pairs, uh, so here I make an RDD of these pairs of ints, uh, one, one, and one, two, uh, you can run an operation on it called reduce by key to, uh, to aggregate stuff for each key. Uh, so here it just adds up the one and the two um, you know, to get a three. So that's really nice. But if you have an RDD that contains something else like just strings, um, you can't actually run that operation and you get this at compile time. You, know, you, you realize they're not key value pairs. So really simple, but this is the kind of thing that you know, if you're writing, say, a complicated, like a pig script or something like that, you wouldn't see until um, you try executing it. And this uses the Scala feature called implicits. I think you know, may maybe um, people who worked with Scala for a while have seen it. Basically, we have a class called RDD that has the methods on any RDD of any type. So things like map and filter, we don't care what the, uh, what the type T inside it is. We can just do it. Um, and then we have another class called pair RDD uh, functions that um, has only functions you want available on RDDs of, of key value pairs. And this is kind of a wrapper object around an RDD called self uh, that knows that the types are, are key value pairs and it has things like reduce by key. And then you create this implicit um, conversion function which says uh, if I have an, an RDD of, of, of um, uh, key and value, I can convert it into a pair RDD functions object. So what that does is when Scala sees the line of code, you know, rdd.reduce by key, it looks in rdd and it says, wait a minute, there's no method called reduce by key in here. Uh, that's kind of bad. But then it says, okay, but there is an implicit conversion from rdd to this thing called pair rdd functions. And that conversion happens to work because this is an rdd of, of key and value. It wouldn't work if this was an rdd of just double or of string or something like that. So basically the compiler rewrites the code as this. And and you can sort of extend your RDD class with, with new operations based on the type that's in there. Um, so you know, it's basic stuff that, that um, happens in, you know, in other Scala libraries as well, but it's nice that you, know, you don't have to do anything special for this. Um, we use this in lots of places. We use that for the key value pairs I showed. We use that for numeric types, uh, things like uh, things that might have a mean or a sum or things like that. Uh, we use that for types with, uh, with an ordering defined, so things that are comparable, you can sort them by the key. And then one, one of the nice places where we uh, improve the, the API over Hadoop map reduce is we, can also, we use it for things that you can convert to Hadoop's writable type, which is just sort of a standard type for um, making, uh, you 
know, for records that you can save in the many Hadoop file formats, um, such as sequence file. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, types for which we know how to convert them, uh, or types that extend writable, you can just use your standard Scala types, and um, we automatically turn it into these Hadoop types, like int writable and text, that you'd have to build by hand in Java. Okay, so this is the, the type part. Um, okay. Uh, second, uh, second example I want to talk about um, is, a, is a newer thing, um, and this is the, the integration between uh, Scala code and SQL. So and actually, um, a lot of the, the other things I'll show relate to this. Um, so I'll, I'm going to step back a bit and say why, uh, you know, why we're looking to do this. So I showed before in the, in the intro to Spark, I showed uh, you can use SQL as an input source, which is really nice from a lot of systems that talk SQL, such as Hive. Um, we also want to let you use SQL to do more complicated um, uh, queries and aggregations on the data you have in RDDs. Um, and the reason for that is that um, it, it lets us optimize the execution of those better. So when you write an application using these functional operators I showed before, like the map and the filter and so on, it's, it's nice, you've, you've written it down, but it's, it's very opaque to the runtime system because you just gave it a function. And unless we go in and, and try to inspect your function um, at, at compile time or at runtime and essentially write you know, a, a, a Scala, um, uh, you know, a compiler for a subset of Scala, it's very hard for us to understand how to optimize uh, the, that code. Um, so SQL is a really nice way to write, um, you know, many types of queries, not everything, but, but many things, uh, that is, um, you know, um, uh, narrow enough to allow uh, automatic optimizations, and it's very well studied how to optimize it. Um, and, you know, again, because we want to target, for instance, data scientists or people who come uh, from this, you know, less of a hardcore, like, oh, let's, let's just write a couple of map functions uh, background, we also expect that a lot of users will prefer to write SQL uh, to, to writing, um, you know, just, just general code in, in many cases. So one of the cool things we've done is using Scala um, reflection, you can use SQL not just on, on uh, external data sources like Hive, but also on your RDDs of Scala objects. And you can get a lot of these benefits of, a, of a automatic optimization on them. So here's how it works. So in um, Scala, you know, you, you define your data types. For example, maybe you have a class named person, and then you construct an RDD out of them. And here I'm just doing standard um, sort of Spark stuff. So I'm taking a text file. Uh, maybe I, I split things by commas because there's a, you know, a name, comma, age. Uh, and then I create a person from it. Um, so that's pretty easy. But then I can take uh, this, this set of uh, objects and say register as table and call it people. Um, and what will happen is at compile time, Scala gives us a description of this class person. So we know that it has two fields called name and age. And so when we register a table, we automatically have a, a schema for it where we know, you know the name is a string and the age is an integer. And then once I've registered my, my people as a table, I can actually just run SQL on it the same way as I would on an external data source. So for example, you know, this, this thing maybe, you know, this is a simple query, but um, maybe you know, writing this query efficiently on, on the person objects would have required several steps of Scala or something like that. And here I can just write it as a SQL statement. And in the current version API, the result of, of this is an RDD of these Ho objects. So Ho is, is kind of like your, um, you know, like your JDBC Ho object. It's just a general like data container, and I can access each field in it by indexing it. Um, you know, so field zero. Um, so this, you know, so, so far uh, it's good I've been able to run SQL, but, uh, but the types I get back are not super friendly. Um, one of the really cool things that's coming in Scala, um, you know, in the future, it's in development by uh, a number of folks at um, EPFL, is, is called um, record types. So using records in Scala, you can actually also get type safe uh, output from SQL. So instead of writing, you know, T parentheses zero and then presumably casting it as a string because I know that it's a string, I could actually just write t.name over here. And uh, the way this works is there's some uh, magic involving macros that turns this into t0 dot uh, as instance of string, actually. Um, so what's th so this is a pretty cool thing. So so basically the way this works is there is um, you know in in when this program is compiled, um, there's a macro that looks at this string and 
passes it through a SQL parser and understands that okay, name and and people, you know, will be you know will be a certain uh, uh, will be fields in this thing and will be of a certain type, and then it actually uh, lets me check this, uh, you know, what this method name means, which field ID it will be, and get it back. And if I do other things instead, like a field that doesn't exist, I will also get a compiler, um, which will know because we look at SQL and we say, hey, you're not selecting anything um, called uh, called foo. So this is a pretty cool thing. This is still uh, kind of a researchy thing that's, that's being developed at EPFL, but hopefully something that we can use. Uh, but even the first part with reflection is nice for moving data between the two worlds. And when you, when you do this stuff in SQL, uh, we automatically do a number of optimizations for you. So these, these are already in Spark. So first on the storage side, um, we, um, we use an efficient column-oriented uh, storage format, uh, which is often many times smaller than just storing stuff as Java objects, which is you know, what we'd normally have to do if we didn't know anything about your data type. And uh, it also lets us do stuff like compress your data and operate directly on the compressed data and stuff like that. Um, and then on the processing side, we can understand all the query you're doing. Uh, you know, maybe you're selecting many things at once and turn it into the, the most efficient execution that we can find. So do a lot of the stuff that otherwise you'd have to, uh, to figure out um, and, and tune by hand. So this is, you know, this is one way that uh, we're letting people do more, um, you know, uh, more sophisticated queries more efficiently um, on top of RDDs. Okay. So these, these are just a couple of the things that are you know, user facing that um, you know, are part of the API. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is a couple of things we're doing inside that are pretty cool. These are more, uh, you know, uh, kind of more involved for, for people developing these systems, uh, but they've let us build these kind of features very quickly. And the first one I want to talk about is, okay, how, how do we actually optimize this SQL? So, you know, I said that it's uh, writing queries in SQL is, is nice because it lets, up, uh, come up, it lets us come up with an efficient execution plan, but now as the Spark developers, we have to actually implement that um, and it's actually not, not that easy to build you know, an efficient kind of SQL um, execution engine. So we, and we built um, a Spark SQL execution engine, and in particular the optimizer, um, in a, you know, using a, a very um, uh, uh, concise and, and uh, extensible framework that we developed called Catalyst that builds it in a functional way. Um, and uh, what's really nice about this is a lot of the stuff that normally you know, in, in a database query optimizer would take many months or years to develop, you can express very quickly here, and you can iterate quickly, and um, you know, uh, and, and uh, improve uh, the kinds of optimizations that the system can do. And um, if you, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show exactly how this stuff works, but if you uh, know a little bit of the history of, of functional languages and um, uh, uh, especially features such as pattern matching, a lot of these features were actually developed to make it easier to build compilers. So it shouldn't be a surprise that building a, uh, you know, essentially a SQL compiler becomes easier using a functional language. So let me explain a little what happens in query optimization. So SQL, unlike um, Scala, uh, well, unlike certainly unlike something like Java, is is a declarative language, uh, which means that you express what you want to to compute. Uh, you know, like the sum of these values grouped by this, but not exactly how to um, how to compute it. Um, and um, that means that the the runtime system needs to pick a good plan, a good execution strategy uh, to actually run it. So just as a really simple example, I'm going to have a, a extremely, uh, you know, a minimal kind of SQL query. Um, so this is going to be, okay, I have, uh, first I select the ID and name from a table called people, um, and then I select the name from this result where ID is equal to one. This is kind of a weird query, but um, it's just, just meant to be kind of a toy example that still shows something we can optimize. And uh, you can imagine this would happen if this was the result of some subquery or, or some function like that, uh, or even the result of like reading, uh, you know, a, a view or something like that in SQL. So, you know, basically we pick these two guys and then we pick only the name where ID is equal to one. So this is the, the you know, in, in a database, the first thing you do when you see this is you create a logical plan. Uh, here you just chain together the operators you want to do um, and, uh, and don't worry about reordering them or, or, or optimizing them in any way. You just want something that has the same logic as, as that statement, gives you the same result. And, um, 
the most naive way to execute it then would be to just execute each operator right away. So what this means here is, okay, we have a table called people. Um, let's do the first select. This is called the projection operator. So let's just project out these two columns, ID and name. Let's filter it on ID equals one, and then let's pull out the name. So that's, that's one, you know, one, one thing that you might do to, to run this query. Uh, now, if you wanted to optimize this, you could probably do more uh, interesting things. So, for example, if the database had an index in it on ID, uh, you could just say, hey, let's look in the index for things where ID is equal to one and find a pointer to those records and return the name. And that's a much better physical plan. But unfortunately, dealing with all the possible logical plans and writing some, some code to come up with the physical plan for it is pretty hard. Um, so you can't just hard code all the possible things like, oh yeah, if there's a project and then a filter and then another project, we should do an index lookup in, in this case. Um, so one of the common ways to, to improve this is to write um, simple rules, which are small um, changes you can make to the query plan one at a time, uh, that if you keep applying all these rules, end up with, with an efficient plan. Um, and basically, um, if you just write a collection of rules then and keep applying them to the plan until no more rules can be used, um, you end up with, a, you know, with something efficient. So here's an example of how we might get this, uh, this execution using rules. So we might say, okay, here's our original plan. You know, we have the, the project and the filter, and um, let's just apply one rule. So one common rule um, is called uh, filter pushdown. So basically the idea of that is um, we notice that we pull out, um, um, let me see, we, we pull out ID and name here, and then we filter on just ID. So instead of actually loading all of these immediately from, uh, you know, from the underlying system and keeping all the IDs and names in memory and then throwing out um, you know, many of them when we check out the ID, uh, we could instead move the filter down here. So we could say, hey, as we read people, let's filter out only the ones with ID equals one. And then we, we do these other things to project out uh, the name. And in this case, we can swap these operators because the, the objects used in the, in the filter are are all, um, you know, are all things that we're projecting, basically. So, um, so it's okay to move the filter down, um, down there. Okay, so this is one, uh, you know, one optimization. Um, next, we might do, okay, uh, may, there might be a second rule which says, hey, if we have a project and another project, we pulled out some subset of the field's ID and name, and then we pulled out another subset of that, it's enough to just do that one. So we don't need to run two of these at the same time. Um, and finally, there might be a thing that says, hey, if we have the table called people and we look at only the ID field, we can turn that into an, uh, in, an index lookup instead. And you know, for this kind of pattern, we can just return the name. So this would be three rules that let us get this, uh, this result. So there's been, so the question is how, how do you actually build a, a, a system to do this? And there's been a bunch of work on making it easier to write query optimizers. You know, the old fashioned way is you actually write a bunch of Java code or C++ code that, uh, you know, implements each rule and looks at, ob at, at, at objects and tries to transform them. Um, and so some, some of the previous systems that did this are things like Volcano and ca Cascades that actually built a, um, a, a, a separate programming language for express Expressing these rules and then evaluating them, um, and you know that's uh, that's uh, you know it's it's it makes it easier to write the rules, but it means the the database developers have to learn this new language, and if the language isn't powerful enough to express all the things you want to use in your rules, then you know you might not be able to specify things. So in uh, Catalyst, which is the, the um, execution engine on, on Spark, um, we do all this stuff instead using Scala, and we do it using pattern matching and, and functional programming in Scala, and uh, we, we get to use the full Scala language in specifying the rules and also in, in transforming these, um, you know, these execution plans. So the way it works is this uh, tree node library that we have in there. So the, the operators in the logical plans I showed and in the physical plans are these form these trees that you can hook together. And on these trees, we have uh, standard um, uh, sort of collection functionality. So you can just run functions on them to inspect the tree. Um, we have this transform function, which lets us apply a rule and modify the whole tree. And we also have a lot of the nice features. These, these tree nodes are just Scala case classes. So you can automatically print them out nicely. You can hook them together. You can serialize them, you know, send them over the network, all that stuff you get because they just come from Scala. 
So let me just show how, how the tree transformations work. Um, so basically, um, you, you uh, to, to express a rule in the catalyst optimizer, you give um, uh, it a, a partial function from a tree a node to from a tree to another tree, essentially. And we look at it and we say, um, for, for each operator in the tree, we say, okay, if the partial function applies to it, which means it, it has a pattern in there for matching on, on this, uh, you know, on, on whatever we have in that operator, um, let's run it and replace it with the result. If it doesn't apply, we, we just don't change it. And if we have a bigger tree, we apply this recursively at each operator in it to, uh, you know, to, to, until we, we, we run out of places where we can use this rule. So just as an example of these, um, you know, of, of, of one of these, let's look at the filter pushdown thing we did before. Um, in that one, we said, okay, let's look at filters that sit on top of project operators and see if we can push them down so that we, so we don't have to project, um, you know, the, the data before. And um, basically, we we. To, to do that, we want to check that um, you can evaluate the filter on the table that's underneath here. So without um, without the result of the project. So without uh, you know if, if we create new fields in here or something like that. Um, so we want to push it down underneath that. And if so, uh, we want to switch out the operators and move the project um, on top of it. Okay. So this is this is kind of the whole. And so this is the the code in um, you know in, in Catalyst um, and in Spark SQL to do that. Um, and I'll I'll walk through this code a little bit, but you know it, it's actually not a ton of code. Um, and th it's basically one of these partial functions. So. What we do is we have uh, here query plan is our initial tree and transform is one of these that we called and the body of transform is a is a Scala partial function so this is like a function except it has it may only match certain types of inputs so it has these case statements in here and on other types of inputs it's not defined. So what we're doing in this one is um, just some, some pattern matching. So we say, okay, we look if we want the we look for a tree node that's a filter. We're just gonna call it F, and uh, this is actually like the condition of it. So we don't care what it is, but we care that its child is a project, and the child has some kind of grandchild. The grandchild is like the the table scan that we had before. So this this just means that there's a filter above a project. Um, and then um, we do an, um, uh, an if statement. So we, uh, we say, okay, if um, the, the, this uh, filter only references fields that are already in the grandchild, so not new fields that are introduced somehow by the project, uh, then it's okay to push it down. We don't need to do the project before. And this is how we create the new object. So basically, we take the project, we, we move it first, and then we make the filter be its child. Uh, this thing, if you haven't seen it, is just uh, you know, a way to copy a, a case class and change just a few of the fields. Um, so, so then we just switch the order. So it's not, you know, basically, um, um, it's um, a very concise way of writing this rule. And in, in uh, Spark SQL, we can just have an array of these rules uh, and just keep running each of them and applying them. Um, again, the, the stuff looks really small. To, to give a sense, though, of, of how things work, you know, a lot of the rules that we wrote in Spark SQL using, you know, this this short of, of an amount of code uh, took sort of hundreds of lines of code to do before in, say, the Hive Query Optimizer or systems like Optic or things like that, which are which are the open source query optimizers. So using this, we've been able to build out the the set of optimizations in Spark SQL very quickly, and we've also had community members. Uh, just come in and, and implement you know, specific optimizations without having to know a ton about the rest of the system. So it's a really nice way uh, to compose them. Okay. And then the final thing I want to talk about is uh, also from Spark SQL, it's code generation. And this is another thing that traditionally has been very time consuming to, uh, to build in, in, a, in a database system. Uh, and many uh, SQL systems actually ended up not building it, but that we've been able to do in a, in a very uh, powerful way using Scala. So if you look at SQL on Hadoop systems um, in, in particular, many of them uh, just evaluate expressions that they see in your query. So if you do select A plus B from table, uh, they actually um, build a, a tree that represents oh, A and then a plus and then a B, and they uh, interpret that tree on each record that you read, kind of like a, a programming language interpreter. 
Uh, but evaluating stuff this way can be quite expensive, especially on the JVM. Um, you get these operators that are, uh, you know, that are uh, uh, subclasses of, of some common interface. So you get these virtual function calls, and the, the inliner can't always, uh, you know, uh, inline those in, a, in an efficient way because there can be many implementations. Uh, you get uh, branches, so you look at, oh, is this a plus? Is this an if state? You know, is this a minus? Is this a multiply? And branches are much more expensive than just executing, you know, straight line code. Um, if you have primitive types, so like integers, uh, you kind of have to wrap everything into an object if your system also supports non-primitives. So that adds a bunch of overhead. And these things consume, you know, a lot of memory in addition to creating objects. And as data sets move more and more to being in memory or on SSDs or things like that, the CPU overhead matters. In systems like Hive, the CPU overhead didn't matter initially because it was completely disk I.O. bound. So it didn't matter that uh, you spend time executing these things. So just as an example, you know, to look at this uh, interpreting A plus B kind of uh, example, um, you might have, you'd build, you know, a class that represents the add uh, instruction, and then a class that represents, okay, read field A and read field B. And then you'd, on each record, you'd, if, you'd call evaluate on this guy. And uh, this one would say, okay, let's do A dot eval. Um, gives, it gives us back an integer, except it's wrapped as an object. Let's do B as dot eval, gives us back an integer. Now we we pull the integers out of those objects and we add them, and now we have to return it up. So you could easily write kind of a, a bunch of classes to do this, but it wouldn't be very efficient. So there is, you know, a standard approach to do this in, 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 in database systems, which is code generation. Um, you look at these expressions and you compile them to native code, or, you know, if you're on the JVM, you can compile them to Java bytecode, which quickly after becomes native code, and then you can evaluate them quickly. But the problem is implementing code gen, you know, from, from scratch is, is usually a many uh, sort of person, many year engineering effort um, if you want to do it for a big subset of SQL. And we kind of needed to do it from scratch because we deal with a lot of interesting data types and functions that are not in standard SQL systems. So as I showed, we wanted to let you just take in Scala objects as the input, uh, you know, that you run SQL on. We actually also make it very easy to register functions from Scala into SQL. SQL and call them on there. And we have these weird data types like um, uh, structures and maps and stuff to deal with things like JSON data. So we couldn't just grab an existing uh, you know, SQL system and, and, and grab the code generation from there. So there's a really cool uh, feature um, based on Scala macros that actually makes it possible uh, to do code generation easily. And um, that's called um, quasi-codes. And I should say, by the way, I think I forgot to say it earlier, but for both this and Catalyst, the lead uh, developer is, is actually Michael Armburst, who uh, works at Databricks. But it's, uh, he, he built both these things, uh, you know, actually in just the past six months, he, he figured out, you know, both these techniques to make, uh, to make this stuff um, run well. Um, I forgot to say that before. Um, so anyway, so, so there is, so as I said, so code generation is what you want to do. And there's a really cool feature in Scala called quasi-quotes that, uh, that lets you do this. And this is a way to essentially stitch together bits of Scala code at runtime and then compile them. Um, and it's enabled by, mac by macros. So here's how you do code generation you know, for, for an expression. If we wanted to support just addition and say um, integers, uh, say integer fields. So you, you, get, uh, you, know, you get just a, a, an expression. This is like my class that maybe add and um, you know, field access are, uh, are, are subclasses of. And then uh, here I'm just gonna do pattern matching. And on, from, the, from this thing, you can return back what's called a tree. This is a, a Scala compiler uh, tree, basically. It's, it's, a, it's an expression in Scala. And you do that by just writing the string with a Q in front, so some Scala code that can also grab fields from outside. Um, so here, for instance, when I have an attribute, and ordinal is maybe its name, um, yeah, I can do, um, you know, get int as that guy. And when I see an add, I can, I can write code that, okay, I generate code for the left upper hand, generate code for the right, and return them back. 
And what's really cool about this is these three objects get composed together at runtime and then passed to the Scala compiler. And whatever expression they had, I got a Scala class that has the right code stitched together for it. So instead of messing around with like, okay, I'm going to build my own compiler and uh, deal with, uh, with subsets of SQL and stuff like that, I can just reuse the Scala compiler in a very nice composable way to get this. And then the end result is you get code like this that's actually really efficient, that has the right types, you know, just adds them in line, no virtual functions, um, and everything is in line. And we were able to build the first version of this in just uh, you know, a couple of weeks and, and deal with many of the expressions. And this is, again, a place where we've had lots of external contributors who you know, maybe know very little about how the rest of Spark SQL work, but are able to put in optimizations for the pieces that they care about. Um, and in terms of performance, it actually sees significant performance gains as well. So Shark is our previous system that used um, uh, interpretation, and Spark SQL with CodeGen, you know, in, in many queries, is, is actually quite a few times um, uh, faster than this one. Um, and this, again, would have been very hard without, um, without using a high-level language. Okay. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Hopefully it's given you a sense of some of the cool things you can do both in user-facing APIs and internally. Um, and just a few slides on, on what's next. Um, so we think there's lots of opportunity to do more with Scala in the Scala API. Uh, some examples of this are the uh, Scala team is spending a bunch of time on, on serialization, on making it efficient to, to serialize objects and send them over the network, or making it type safe, for instance, to have functions you can safely send to another machine, and these will be great to incorporate in Spark. Um, Scala async is a cool way to launch asynchronous jobs that we'd like to support to let you run multiple jobs at the same time. And for the math stuff, compiling numeric expressions to you know, fast uh, C code is also an interesting thing that we'd like to do. Um, and Scala 2.11 is not yet supported in Spark, but it's getting really close. So hopefully uh, it's, it's an active development, and hopefully it will be out um, in the next release with, with all the, the cool features of that. Um, if you want to learn more about Spark, there's a lot of uh, info on our website. And this is a thing you can play with on just your laptop. You don't need a cluster of machines uh, to do stuff. So if you just want to play around with it, it's, it's, it's fun to do. Um, and we at, at Databricks have made virtually all our training um, resources available for free after the fact. Uh, the only thing you don't get is an instructor in the room with you. Uh, but you can see videos, uh, training exercises um, on uh, the Spark Summit website, which is our latest content. Um, so hope that's given you a sense of some of the things we're doing in Spark. Uh, we want to give you a next generation engine for big data, and we've been able to do a lot of that in interesting ways with this next generation language, and hopefully we'll see more of them in the future. So if you want to see some uh, cool uses of Scala, you, sh you could definitely check this out either as a user or as a developer. And the final thing is that if you liked any of this stuff, if you want to work on this kind of stuff, uh, we are hiring. So uh, definitely reach out to us about that. So thanks. <laughs>